Good morning, Mount Sinai. Good to be with you again. Pray that all is well with you. Last week we went to 3 John, verse 1 and 2, that talked about uh, uh, the great love that John had for his beloved Gaius. This week we're going to basically the same spot, a couple of verses down. 3 John, verses 3 and 4, that uh, talks about... Uh, some joy that uh, John received uh, in his relationship with Gaius and how Gaius walked in the truth. So today we're going to talk about walking in the truth. Last week, walking in love, and this week, walking in the truth. And if you walk in love and in truth, then God will take care of you. Uh, Third John verse 3 says, For I rejoice greatly, when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Our Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray that you would uh, fill us with your spirit and guide us with your truth that our fears may be relieved. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of the brethren had made several visits to John, and they had joyfully reported that Gaius was a glowing example of what a Christian ought to be. In my own personal pastorage, uh, I have had some experiences, and I must confess that I have often been a bit on edge when people come to me and say, I know Mrs. or I know Mr. so-and-so that are members of the church you pastor. Or even worse, I know one of your members quite well. John never had to fear when Gaius's name came up. What made Gaius such a good testimony is God's truth. The truth was in him and enabled him to walk in obedience to God's will. Gaius read the word, meditated on it, and delighted in it, and then practiced it in his daily life. In other words, the way my youngest son uh, put it in uh, Henry III uh, in his book, uh, Inductive Bible Study, I believe Gaius recognize three things that are important in God's word as it pertains to us. Observation, interpretation, and application. Observation informs us what the text is talking about. Interpretation is what is the text saying specifically to me? Too often we want to find out what it's uh, saying about somebody else, but not about us. And then the third one is application. How can I use what I've read, what I've heard from God today through his word? What digestion is to the body, meditation is to the soul. It's not enough to merely hear the word or read the word. We must inwardly digest it and make it a part of our inner person. Paul remembered how the Thessalonians received the word of God in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Here is another reason why we never stop thanking God. When you receive God's word from us, you realize it wasn't the words of humans. Instead, you accepted it for what it really is, the word of God. This word is at work in all believers today. It's clear that Gaius' entire life was wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in truth. True living comes from the living truth. Jesus Christ, the truth, 
that we read about in John 14 and 6 when he had uh, talked to his, uh, his disciples and comforted them uh, because he had to leave them. And he said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. And if it was not so, I wouldn't have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. And if I go, I'll come back again to take you to where I am so that we can be together. This verse, Jesus reveals to them the significant part of his life about the truth. As they asked him to show them the way to where he was going. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can get to the Father except through me. Jesus is revealed in the word, which is the truth of God. John 17, verse 15 through 17 says, I pray that thou shouldest take them out of the world, that he, he's asking God not to take them out of the world, but that God would keep them from all evil. A lot of times we want to be taken out of this messy world, these messy lives that we live in. Verse 16 says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world but sanctify them through your truth. Set them apart through your truth. And your word is truth. The Holy Spirit is also truth. And he teaches us the truth. The Spirit of God uses the word of God to reveal the Son of God to the children of God. And then enables us to obey the will of God and to walk in truth. If we walk in truth, truth will bring us out of darkness. Truth will lighten our steps and path. Truth will strengthen our weary soul. Truth will give us joy, peace. Truth will be our portion, whatever we need. Jesus is the word of God who is made flesh, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All Jesus said was true because he told the truth which God had given him. He promised his disciples that he would send the spirit of truth, a helper who would abide in Christians forever. At the very moment that we started believing the truth, especially the truth about Jesus, that he's the son of God, that he was born of a virgin, that he died for our sins, and that he was raised from the dead. At the very moment we start believing those truths, then the Holy Spirit sets up residence in us and abides with us forever. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus and guides all Christians into all truth. And he glorifies Jesus. John is the teacher and Gaius is the student or disciple or the learner of Jesus Christ. John is expressing the joy that he is feeling, knowing that he had a student of the word of God that was not only at church, but was in the moment and had the church in him. Too often, churchgoers are in the building, but not in the moment. Their minds are miles and miles away on totally different subjects. They come one way, 
and they go back home the same way. Week after week, month after month, year after year sometimes. They come and go with no changes. If you stay around the word of God, in sincerity, if you come like an empty vessel to be filled, then the word of God can be like a fire. It might be like it was with Jeremiah when Jeremiah was disgruntled and no longer wanted to speak about God, not, not even mention his name, didn't want to go to church no more. But Jeremiah 20 and 8 says, if I say I will not mention him or speak anymore in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire. You've heard the how the preacher say it, like a fire shut up in my bone. And I am weary of holding it in. I cannot. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody. In the words of Jeremiah, but I can't keep it to myself. And I don't know about you, but I'm like Jeremiah. God has been so good to me that I can't keep it to myself. I must tell somebody. Or maybe it's like the, the men that were joined by Jesus on the road to Emmaus, that after they heard Jesus break to them the bread of life. They went back testifying in the form of a question, did not our hearts burn within us when he break to us the bread of life? The truth makes a difference in our lives. And I'm not talking about a hoax or fake news. I'm talking about truth that is verifiable. Truth that is verifiable no matter where you stand in time. Isaiah was standing in the B.C. before Christ. As a good cub reporter would, he was standing there with, with, with a pen and, pen, pen and paper in his hands, recording what he was seeing with his eyes. L listen to Isaiah 53. It sounds like Isaiah was at Calvary writing down the events play by play. He says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of God been revealed? Here it is. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. In his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah was a good reporter. What kind of reporter are we? Then let's go back to Abraham. Let, let's, let, let's look at what it takes to really worship God. And, and to truly worship God is an indication that you know the truth, that God has revealed himself in a miraculous way that you can't forget. Abraham found himself after begging God for years for an heir. And now let's join Abraham as he takes Isaac, the promise that God had given him, the son that would be his heir, that he could hand over everything that he had accumulated. He could place it in Isaac's hand. That's what he wanted in life. But now God has called him to take Isaac up on a mountain and offer him as a sin offering. On their way to the place, Isaac asks a probing question. And he answers part of it. He says, Daddy, I see the wood 
and I see the fire. But where is the sacrifice? Abraham answered him prophetically, my son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And just as Abraham drew the knife back, can't you see the imaginary knife in my hand? Just as Abraham drew the knife back before he brought it forward towards Isaac, God spoke up and said, Abraham, Abraham, I know now that you fear God. And you haven't held back your son from me. And in, in my imaginary mind, it, it, it's, it's like God said next to Abraham, listen. And we're in a time and place in our lives where it's important that we listen, that we calm down and listen to God for the answers to our problems. Abraham, as he listened attentively, he heard a noise and looked towards the noise. And there stuck in a bush was a lamb. The answer to his problem. He went up the mountain with a heavy heart. And, 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 and right then and there, when he saw that lamb stuck in the thicket, he came up with a new name for God, Jehovah Jireh, meaning God will provide. Anybody with me this morning that, that God has provided something for you? That God, when it seemed dark in your life, he came through? That he, 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 he when you couldn't see no way, God showed up and, and made a way out of nowhere. I think too many of us today are looking to Donald Trump for an answer or Nancy Pelosi or the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, but neither of them hold the answer. Jesus himself is the answer. While Abraham was on his way up the mountain on one side with a heavy heart, God was on his way up the mountain on the other side with the answer. And then that's in the BC. But let's look at this matter of truth. From the middle of BC and AD. Let's, let's catch up with John. There he is. And he's calling the crowds to attention. He says, look, behold, the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. And you really can't mention that without mentioning John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, all we got left now is the A.D. Let's, let's, let's take a look at truth from the A.D. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, called the attention of the Israelites. In Acts 2 and 22, he says, listen carefully to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man thoroughly accredited by God to you by the miracles and wonders and signs that God did through him are common knowledge to you. He says, this Jesus, following the deliberate and well thought out plan of God, was portrayed by men who took the law into their own hand and was handed over to you. What a stern indictment. He says, and you nailed his hands to the cross and killed him. But God untied the death rope and raised him up. Death was no match for Jesus. Drop down to verse 36. Peter says, all Israel then know this. There's no longer room for doubt. And when you know the truth, there's no room for doubt. 
He says, God has made him both Lord and Savior. This Jesus whom you killed on the cross. Philippians 2 and 10 and 11 says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The truth that saves us is the gospel that declares one Friday on a skull-shaped hill, on an old rugged cross, Jesus hung, bled, and he died for sinners like us. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. But early the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand. Let's see. I, I need to make that plainer. I need to make it real. Here we go. I wish I had a, a paintbrush and try, I could try to paint you a picture, but, but without the paintbrush, lend me your mind. Come go with me. To the trial. I, I'm not talking about where they marched Jesus from judgment hall to judgment hall. I, I'm talking about another trial. The trial held for the human race. The evidence was presented and the judge found all guilty because all have sinned and come short of God's glory. Here's where the situation changes, though. The judge stands up and removes his robe and the judge leaves the bench and comes to where we are. And says, let these go free. I'm taking their place. Jehovah Jireh became the lamb for our sacrifice. And that's why Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is so important to me. For ye are saved by grace through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Let us walk in truth. As we confront the difficult days ahead, let's remember that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Let us remember that if God is for us, and he is, then he's more than the world against us. This predicament that we find ourselves is not too hard for God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would calm our spirits with the assurance of your presence. Let us know without a doubt that everything will be all right. Remind us that we are in a win-win situation because for us to live is Christ and to die is gain. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, I've got to bid you farewell once again, hopefully until next week. Uh, but in the meantime, remember, love one another and not just each other, but love even your enemies and walk in the truth. And God will delight in the choices you make in life. The psalmist says, the Lord orders the step of a good man and he delights in his way. So let's walk in love and in truth. And be confident that God will take care of you. See you next week. Love you. Bye-bye.